All right. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Lynn and uh, Joe, and, and uh, to MBCA for inviting me to speak this morning. Uh, there's nothing better for me. I speak to a lot of doctor groups, and uh, to have a chance to speak uh, with and to patients in the audience for me is a highlight. I like it so much more than speaking to doctor groups. Uh, and it's just a wonderful weekend to be in Boston. I've spent most of my adult life in Boston, although I live in New York City now. But uh, this weekend, with the head of the Charles, the final game of the American League Championship Series, and the Patriots are going to beat the Jets tomorrow. So uh, it is uh, fantastic. It's not easy living in New York and rooting for the Patriots and the Red Sox, let me tell you. Uh, thanks. So uh, it's going to be a nice weekend. Uh, let me just uh, take a brief survey, if I can, of the audience. I'd just like to know, because maybe I'll see some of my old patients here. In fact, I did meet one already uh, who I saw when I was living in Boston. But how many uh, here are from the Mass General um, uh, Clinic and, and, and take, get their care there? If you, Okay. And how about from um, the Brigham and Women's Hospital? A few. And the Beth Israel Deaconess? And Boston Medical Center? A couple? Good. And uh, what else? St. Elizabeth's? Uh, and maybe some other hospitals outside of Boston. But uh, how many from other hospitals that get to care? Oh, so there are a couple. Good. All right. Well, what, what are we going to do today for uh, the next uh, 45 minutes? And I, my presentation is pretty brief, uh, so I hope there are some questions that we can address after this. I'm going to talk about, uh, really try to give you an overview of clotting. Uh, this is titled, um, let me see, where do we go here? Uh, in terms of uh, are you at risk for blood clots, but I want to talk about what blood clots are, how they form a little bit, um, talk about risk factors that many of you may be familiar with. Uh, if not, hopefully we'll learn something today. And, um, and then a little bit, uh, uh, I'm going to say just a slide or two about treatment. Uh, the next speaker will cover uh, treatment in much more uh, detail. So if we talk about, venous, uh, about blood clots, you have to separate in your mind the venous system from the arterial system, because they're both very different and different types of clots and different causes of the clots. And what most of us here today, but not everybody, but most of us are concerned about venous blood clots. And those individuals with atrial fibrillation who are on warfarin or Coumadin or one of the new anticoagulants uh, to prevent a stroke, even though that's in the arterial blood flow, it actually behaves a lot like a venous blood clot, as opposed to patients who have blood clots in their coronary arteries uh, or in their large arteries elsewhere in the body, that's a different system. So with venous blood clots, we're dealing with clotting that occurs in relatively slow blood flow, not very rapid blood flow, which is more common in the arteries. Uh, and fibrin is a protein that makes up the matrix of these clots. And uh, with venous blood clots, you get, uh, after the coagulation system is activated, you get a lot of fibrin formation. And as you can imagine, as the red cells are flowing through this mesh network of fibrin, that the red cells get caught up. And you get this uh, clot that looks like this. And platelets are small little cells, very small in our, in our body, that uh, are important in initiating and helping clotting. But in the venous blood system, most clots are made up of red cells and fibrin with a few platelets. And they are very big, usually in the leg. And they're like jelly. If you can think of Welch's grape jelly, I like Welch's. And, uh, but I have no relationship to the company. And, but it's, it's like a jelly clot. And that's what it kind of looks like. They're big. Um, as opposed to arterial clots, where uh, a blood clot forms in an artery, it could be a large artery or a small artery, but typically we think of uh, in, the, in the coronary arteries of our heart, which are very small. Um, and the blood flow is relatively rapid, and it's related to uh, vascular injury often. Uh, and although fibrin plays a role and red cells play a role, platelets are really uh, activated and play the primary role in arterial blood clots so that at the end you have a blood clot that might look like this, uh, and again, very small, where it's mostly platelets, a few red cells, and if you were to take it out and look at it, it would look like what we call a white clot. I mean, it's not a red jelly clot. It's, it's almost like a little fibrous uh, clot. And again, in our legs, if you have a blood clot in your leg, you can imagine a long column of blood that may be uh, a quarter of an inch or so around. Uh, 
that's very big, whereas in the coronary arteries, which are tiny little arteries, the blood clots can be as small as the tip of a ballpoint pen. But obviously, it's in a vital uh, uh, area that can cause a lot of damage. So those, those are the differences. And as a result, just jumping ahead, uh, for venous blood clots, we tend to use anticoagulants, uh, which interfere with fibrin formation as the major treatment, whereas with arterial blood clots, we tend to use antiplatelet agents like aspirin or Plavix or some other drugs that interfere with platelets, not so much with fibrin formation because platelets play a bigger role there. And sometimes we have to use both medications together. In the uh, veins of the legs, uh, where t we typically think of the blood clots, but they can occur in any vein of the body, but most commonly in the legs, clots tend to occur around these valves. In our legs, we have these valves that allow blood to flow up and, if, and not to flow back because the valves close. And that helps the blood going one direction up back to your heart. And the blood tends to clot in and around the back of these valves. And in fact, one of the problems with blood clots in the legs is once the clot forms, it tends to injure these valves and they can cause incompetence of the valves and it leads to can cause chronic swelling and discomfort and other problems after you have a blood clot. Not always, but in a, in a fair percentage of individuals. And so if we think of the, the two major venous blood clot problems, we have uh, deep vein thrombosis, or DVT as we tend to call it, or pulmonary embolism, or PE. Uh, and pulmonary embolism represents a clot that is formed in the leg, but a piece has broken off and has traveled up through the one side of the heart and then through the lungs. And in the lungs, the blood vessels get very small and the blood clot gets trapped in the lungs and that's called a pulmonary embolus. And together we call these venous thromboembolism, VTE is the abbreviation that you tend to see a lot in print. And it's the pulmonary embolism that's really the dangerous, life-threatening problem. The blood clot in the leg is a nuisance. It can hurt, it can cause swelling, discomfort, and all kinds of other symptoms, but the clot itself is generally not life-threatening. But if it breaks off and travels to the lung, that's where you get into problems. And many people have pulmonary embolism when they have a blood clot in the leg. Uh, very small, tiny you know, pieces of, very tiny pieces can break off, and they don't even know it. And in fact, it's uh, shown that about 50% of patients who have a blood clot in their leg actually also have a pulmonary embolism, although most of them are without any symptoms and it's not even known. It doesn't make a difference. You treat all of this the same way, um, but if you have a major pulmonary embolism, that's uh, certainly important. And this is what it looks like in the lungs. This is a lung from a patient who succumbed to pulmonary embolism, and you can see that this filled up the entire half uh, or the vessels of all the blood going into that lung and, and led to the patient's death. And that's what is really life-threatening and serious. And you can see here, I'm not going to go through the signs and symptoms, but uh, these are some of the signs and symptoms that people experience with uh, pulmonary embolism. Um, but these are also signs and symptoms that you experience with uh, a little muscle strain or a little overworking or a little uh, anxiousness or a little cold or, uh, well, this is something that you certainly should worry about. I mean, so it's not specific. Uh, you know, we all have, I get chest pain all the time, and I say, gee, is that a heart attack? Is it a pulmonary embolism? Or did I just sort of twist the muscle a little bit? And being a doctor, I can usually discern the difference pretty easy, but a lot of patients don't, and they get very anxious about it as to what might be the cause. Um, so, you know, these are some of the things. And uh, with deep vein thrombosis, you can see here a slight asymmetry. This is a very mild case. Um, and here is a much more significant problem with swelling and redness and, and discomfort in the leg. And again, some of the signs and, si oops, some of the signs and symptoms of a, pulmonary, of a DVT, pain, swelling, tenderness, uh, and so on. And again, these uh, are all also relatively nonspecific. We can get the pain and, and swelling from lots of other causes. And when you present to an emergency room or to your doctor, the question is, is this a DVT? Or is it simply a muscle strain or some, something else that is causing the problem?